Uh, good morning to all of you again. Good to see you again here. Uh, let us now turn to Luke Gospel, chapter 13. I'm going to read from verses 1 to 9. Luke Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. I'm reading from the New King James, chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffer such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit, well. But if, uh, but if not, after that you can cut it down. Uh, let's just turn to God again in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, once again we look up to you for your grace upon us. Father, we are mindful that we come to your inspired word that you have given to us in the Old and the New Testament. These are your words given for the good of men. And we come to you, O oh Father, we are mindful that oftentimes our minds may be troubled by many things. And we ask that you will give us grace, that we may be quiet uh, in your presence. Give us much grace that we may understand your truth and also to apply it in our lives. Father, therefore, be gracious to us, for without your blessings upon us, we are so much poorer. For this we ask and pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, December 11, not September 11, December 11, 1993, I think some of you perhaps were not born yet, there was an incident that happened in this country uh, and became quite, uh, quite known uh, throughout the country. It was the collapse of the Highland Tower. Have you heard of that? The collapse of the Highland Tower? Uh, and that was in Taman Hillview, Ulu Klang, Selangor. 48 people died. A Christian friend of mine owned a unit in that tower. But thankfully, when the tower collapsed, he was working in the office. So he was spared. But, the, but the unit, his unit was gone. Was this God's judgment upon the people who died on that day? That was one of the questions asked by a non-Christian non -Christian friend of mine. Was this God's judgment? Or what was God's purpose, if not God's judgment? Now today we are going to look at God's judgment, but I'm not going to look at everything, every aspect of God's judgment. There are just two particular aspects that we want to look at uh, from the text here. Firstly, man's suffering and God's judgment. Secondly, God's patience and God's judgment. So these are the two particular areas that we want to look at this morning. So let's just look at the first. Man's suffering and, God, and God's judgment. When tragedy happens to some people, is it because of their personal sin. In some ways, they have sinned against God and because they didn't repent of their sin, therefore such things happen to them and they die in that tragic kind of circumstances. Now, in the text here, there were two incidents mentioned here. The first incident is found in verse 1 of our text. Some Galileans have been killed by the governor, Pilate, while they were offering up their sacrifices in the temple. Now, this incident was brought up by some of the Jews to the attention of Jesus Christ. The assumption here was this. These Galileans had committed some grievous sins against God, and therefore they were punished in this gruesome manner. You see, to these Jews, 
there was a, this was a judgment of God upon them. And that is why they die in this tragic kind of circumstances. Now we are not told why Pilate killed these people in the temple in such manner that their blood or the blood of these people were mixed with the blood of the sacrifices. But according to historical record, this governor Pilate was a cruel, very cruel man, an unjust man. And he was transferred out of Jerusalem eventually because of his cruelty. But what happened in the temple was a sacrilege to the Jews. It was a disgrace in the eyes of the Jews. It shouldn't. It, sh it should not happen in this manner. But it happened. You see, to the Jews, this was indeed a sacrilege. It was a disgrace. It was a disrespect to God that this should happen in this manner. So that was the first incident. The second, Jesus himself mentioned about the wall or tower collapse and kill 18 people in Jerusalem. In verse 4, Jesus mentioned that. Again, the people assumed that the people that were killed, the 18 of them, it was because they were more wicked than others. And that is why this kind of tragedy happened to these people. Again, it was assumed to be God's judgment upon these people. Was their presumption correct? Was it indeed a judgment of God upon these people because they were extremely wicked, more wicked than others? That there is this co-relationship between our personal sin against God and the suffering in our lives as a form of God's judgment. And therefore, every time when there is one particular tragedy or some kind of severe suffering in our lives, it is God's judgment. You know, this sounds very much like Job's three friends. Some of you may be familiar with the book of Job. Job suffered greatly in his life. Uh, he lost all his properties and then he lost all his ten children in one day. Ten children, not one, not two. All his children. Think about that. It was indeed uh, a great trial for Job himself. And his three friends heard about that. They came along. They sat beside him. And then when they opened their mouth, they made the suffering of Job worse and increased his emotional turmoil. The best part I think they have contributed to Job or the greatest comfort they had rendered to him was when they were sitting there quietly with him. That was the best comfort I think Job received. But the moment they opened their mouth, that's it. Great turmoil were created in the, in the, in the hearts of Job. Why? Because they assumed that Job had committed some hidden sin somewhere. Nobody knew, but God knows, and God is punishing him. So they, their counsel was very simple. Job, all you have to do is to repent, and everything will be well. One after another, they were speaking in that manner. And Job suffered greatly because of that. Apart from losing his children, now he was suffering from all these wrong assumptions, wrong accusations from his friends. Now, was the Jews correct by making that kind of assumption? Jesus twice, in verse 3 and verse 5, he said, no. And Jesus said to them, unless you repent, you will all perish like these people. That was Jesus' answer. In this sense, Jesus was saying to them, if you think they are worse sinners than you or others, and therefore these things happen to them, you are wrong. Unless you yourself repent, you too will perish. Jesus says that. The point to take note here is this. When tragedy happens, we should take time to reflect upon our relationship with God. 
And if our relationship is not right with God, it is time to get right with God. It is a time to reflect our own relationship with God. Because in a true sense, we are all sinners, whether we like it or not. And as sinners, we rebel against God every day, not just in our actions, but in our thoughts. In Oliver's prayer, he mentioned about there are things we shouldn't have done, and yet we do. There are things that we should render to God, but we didn't. We sin. We sin against God every day. So we deserve God's judgment. We deserve eternal damnation from God because we sin against the holy and the righteous God. And you know, in a sense, in this sense, it is our sin that brought chaos and suffering into this world. You know, in the beginning, God created everything in this world and it was good, God says. Everything He created, it was good. And there was no death, no suffering, no chaos. Until, until Adam sinned and rebelled against God. The beauty, peace, and order were changed from then on. Everything were changed, and everything has remained chaotic today. And there's suffering, there's chaos, there's disorder, there's wickedness around us. It is because of the first sin of Adam, our first parents. So in that general sense, this world is chaotic, there is suffering. Yes, it's because of the sin of man. And we sin every day. And it is indeed a wonder why God has not punished man yet. God could have wiped out the whole mankind. He did once, don't forget that. He could have done that again today and again. Which is a wonder why God is so patient with mankind today. But then the scripture says, God has been very patient with us because it was meant to lead us to repentance before God. That is the intent of God. Why He is not punishing us, wipe us off this earth in one instance. And man must learn to see that God is patient because God has these kind thoughts towards us. And we should be quick to repent of our sin. Paul tells us, he says, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Paul reminds us of that. You know, when... Tragedies happen when the pandemic, COVID-19, happened. What lessons do we learn? What lessons do you learn? I think most Christians believe that God has a message. God has a message for the world, especially the non-believers. And I believe so. There is a message, or more than one. At least God wants the world to know that He is in control. He is a sovereign God, not man. By just this tiny COVID-19 virus, the world came to a standstill. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, God, God has a message for us that God is sovereign, that He is in control. But how about us as Christians? Do we learn something for ourselves through these incidents? Or do we just think that God only has a message for the non-believers? Because they didn't believe, they don't believe in God. I do believe that God has something to say to us as well, as Christians. I can think of at least two. Perhaps God is asking us, as Christians, that we should examine ourselves and our relationship with God. In what aspect? Firstly, whether we have taken the freedom of worship for granted whether we have taken the freedom of worship for granted. Because many professing believers are not regular in the Sunday service. 
And during the pandemic, we lost that freedom, at least for a while. Or perhaps, secondly, whether we have taken the privilege of serving God for granted. Since not many are seen serving God in the local churches. And during the pandemic, we lost that privilege for two years or more. Do we reflect upon our relationship with God during this kind of situation? That whether I myself are getting right with God, walking right with God, instead of just focusing on the rest of the other people, or especially the non-believers, God has a message for them. Yeah, it is true. God has a message for them. But God has a message for His people too. So we look at suffering, man's suffering and God's judgment. Let's just now look at God's patience and God's judgment. Verses 6 to 9 in the parable. Jesus here told a parable. He said, an owner planted a fig tree in his compound. He expected the tree to bear fruit. And he said, for three years I waited. Three years. And the fig tree has no fruit. And therefore he said to one of his servants, perhaps it's time to cut it, or cut it down. But the servant said to the master, Sir, let it alone for one more year, just one more year. I'll put in more fertilizer. And if this one year, if it does, it, it, it does not bear fruit, then perhaps it's time to cut it down, as you say. And the owner is prepared to give it one more year and see what happens. Well, here we can see the owner is quite patient. He has waited three years. Is it a direct reference of Jesus Christ bearing with them for three years? Maybe. I'm not sure. But the, the master is patient. Patiently bearing, um, waiting for the tree to bear fruits. Now the question here is, is, what is the parable about? What is it about? Well, it is about God and the Jews particularly. The fig tree is referring to the nation of Israel. The owner, of course, referring to God himself. God has been good to Israel. God has been good to Israel. God made a covenant with their forebears and that he will be their God and they will be his people. God has made a covenant to bless them if they will continue to obey him. And they are to worship him and be his witness by bearing the fruits of righteousness because they have been called to be a separate people. God is different because there's no other above him. There's no other beside him. He's unique, the only true and the living God. And God has given this privilege to the Jews to know him, to worship him and be his witness. That was their privilege. But what can God find in the nation of Israel? And especially when God sent His only begotten Son to the nation, to the Jews. These people who claim to worship God, and God says, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, God says. Outwardly, they are religious. They love their religion. They will bring their sacrifices to God. Without fail. But at the same time, as God says, they are just seen there superficially, outwardly. But their hearts are far away from me, God says. Because their hearts were also uh, attracted to the idols and other things. And Jesus says this in Matthew 15, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. These are the words from the, from the Lord himself. That God has a charge against this so-called his people. They worship me with their lips. Honor me just outwardly. But their hearts are far away from me. So, in this sense, the nation was barren, Jesus says. 
without fruit. Jesus could not find any spiritual fruits in their lives. All he could see was all these sacrifices, but all these were outward appearance, outward act of worship, so to say. But God also looked into the hearts of his people. Are they worshipping me? Are, do they love me? Are they loyal to me? Are they bearing fruits in their lives? And Jesus could not find any fruits, could not find any spiritual fruits. As a nation, Israel has gone astray. All Jesus could see was a people who loved their religion. They loved their religion. But there's no true love for God in their hearts. It is all about keeping the externals. But their hearts are far from God. I wonder what God would say when He looked down upon His people today in this church, in Sedang, in everywhere, the local churches. What would Jesus say about us? Jesus said, the nation of Israel, there is no spiritual fruit. And it is time for judgment. It is like the fig tree. It's time to cut it down. God has been very good to Israel, but the nation was barren. And God has been very patient towards Israel. Thousands of years have passed since he brought them out of Egypt and put them into the promised land. And since then, God not only God has sent his prophets to minister to them, to warn them, to seek them to come back to him, at the end, God said, I will send my son, my only begotten son, to minister to them. And what was their response? To the Son of God, Jesus himself. Jesus came along and he pronounced that he is the fulfillment, he is the Messiah, he is the Son of God. They look at him, could this man be the Son of God? Look at his home, what kind of home he came from? Not a palace. He was the son of a carpenter. They couldn't believe him. Despite of what Jesus said, despite of his teaching, they could see that he preached with great authority, different from the scribes, different from other teachers. He performed miracles, not just simple, uh, simple miracles of healing headaches, make your leg longer than the, uh, longer, and so that the both both legs are equal. But he performed real miracles. Dead men were made alive. A lame man was healed and he could walk. A blind man was healed, he could see. Real miracles. And Jesus challenged the Jews. He said, if you don't believe what I preach, what I say, you look at the miracles. Can any man, simple, ordinary man, do things like that? Jesus challenged them, but they didn't believe. They didn't believe. They rejected him. And worse, they killed him on the cross. On the cross. The shameful cross. You know, the cross was designed for the worst kind of criminals in the Roman Empire. And they crucified an innocent man, the Son of God, on the cross. They did. And since they have rejected him, Jesus said to them, you too will be rejected by God. And judgment will come upon you. Your temple that you admire, so nice, so beautiful, so majestic, it will be ruined. It will be damaged. It will be brought down. And, Jesus, and God did that in AD 70. When the Roman army led by General Titus attacked the city of Jerusalem and destroyed both the city and the temple, just as Jesus said. That spelled the ends of God's relationship with Israel. Jesus warned them about this. They didn't believe, except the Christians. They were spared because they believed in Jesus' warning. Now this parable, has twofold message for us today. First, 
Let's begin with professing Christians. In the context, Jesus was addressing people who claim to worship God and love God. Now, if you and I claim that Jesus is our Savior, and that you love Him, that you worship Him, then this is what God will expect from us. He expects us to bear fruit in our lives, in your life, in my life. If we claim that we love Him, that we worship Him, that we claim that He is indeed my Savior and your Savior, then this is what Jesus expects from us, to bear fruits in your life. And that is the way to glorify our Father in heaven and to show that we are His disciples. Turn with me to John Gospel 15. John Gospel chapter 15. Let me read to you verses 1 to 8. Verses 1 to 8. John Gospel 15. Verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, and that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the, in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is wither. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, and that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Jesus said this word to the Jews. Jesus is saying these words to us today as we read these words. How do we glorify our Father? How do we glorify the God that we believe to be our God and our Savior, who is kind, who is generous, who is gracious to save us from our sin? How do we glorify Him? Well, Jesus says, if you bear fruit, you will glorify my Father and you will show that you are indeed my disciples. And therefore the reverse is true, isn't it? If we don't bear fruits, our Father in heaven is not glorified. If we don't bear fruits, we show that we are not His disciples. And therefore, if you and I claim to be Christians, then this is what God expects of us. Now, of course, we know we are not perfect as Christians. We are not. None of us is perfect. The best of a Christian is still a man. We need to recognize that. And God is not expecting us to be perfect. But He does expect us to bear fruit. He does expect us to bear fruit. If there's no fruit, He said, then God the Father will take away the, that disciples and throw him into the fire and burn. In verse 2 and 6. And we need to ask ourselves this very sober question. Are you bearing fruits in your Christian life? Am I bearing fruits in my own Christian life? Fruits to show that I am indeed a disciple of Christ. What kind of fruit perhaps you ask? Growing in the knowledge of God in your Christian graces. The Apostle Peter, before he died, he wrote this word at the last verse of his letter. Growing, growing in the knowledge of God and in grace. You know, if a man is dying and he wants to say something important, normally he will keep it to the last. Remember this. Or he will repeat it a few times. And this is what the Apostle Peter says. Grow. Grow in the knowledge of God and in your grace, in the Christian graces, in your Christian character. That is one aspect we can consider. Am I growing in the knowledge of God 
and in my Christian graces, in my Christian character. The both must go together. You know, if you read the Bible a thousand times and you, even you can remember every word, but it doesn't go to the heart, you are not growing. Peter says, grow in the knowledge of God in and in the Christian grace. And some people say, oh, I don't need the Word of God because the Word of God is meant for pastors, for seminary students, or for those who are serious in, in the Scriptures, but they are, I'm just an ordinary Christian. And as long as I have love in my heart and I love God, I love my brethren, that will be good enough. But the question is this, how do you know in what way you should love God and love your brethren without the Word of God as the light to show us how? We can love people blindly. And we may think that, wow, you know, I'm full of love for my brethren. But sometimes that kind of love can spoil other Christians. I'll give you one example. You know, when the Christian church exercises church discipline, you know what other Christians say? Oh, this church has no love. Because they don't believe in the Word of God. They don't believe in church discipline. But it is right there in the Word of God. And God says, this is how you ought to love a brother who has gone astray. To restore him. You see the problem here? If we are ignorant of God's word and we, we, we love the people, and even when they are sin, we pat them and say, it's okay, you know, it's alright. You know, you need help. I, I come and pray with you and it's alright. You know, you don't worry about the church discipline. They have no love. You, you listen to me. Rubbish! That is rubbish. If you have true love for your brother, and God says when he has fallen into sin, you come along and try to pull him back to Christ, to the Word of God. And that's how we love our fellow brother, by the instructions of Christ's Word. And that's why Peter says, grow in the knowledge of God and in Christian graces. You need both. Otherwise, we will go astray. The other aspect we can ask ourselves, am I loving God more? How do I know I love God more? It's not just about the emotion. You know, some people, they go to church, what do they look for? They look for nice feelings. I've been to, a ch to many churches and some of the churches I went that I attended. They have one hour singing. One hour singing. And I was standing there, I was thinking, oh dear, my two legs. You know, I'm, I'm not, oh, I'm not like you young people. You can stand there two hours, it's okay. But for me, more than half an hour, my legs aching. But that is not the main problem. The main problem is that they have one hour singing and they were feeling good but they have 20 minutes or less for the Word of God. You know, I was once uh, invited to preach in the church and I asked them, I normally ask, how much time do I have to preach? And these brothers say, you have about 45 minutes. Oh, I thought, that is okay, not bad. And then they have all their program and activity going on. And they, before my preaching, they have somebody sharing and then I noticed my time is getting less and less. They, they can't extend their time of worship because another congregation is coming in to share the premises. And my so-called 45 minutes is reduced to 15 minutes. <laughs> I say, oh dear. <laughs> you see what I mean? People, they go to church. What do they look for? What do you look for? Nice feeling of the singing and all that. Oh, today I, I was so uplifted because... You know, the singing was fantastic. Now, that's good. If the singing here is fantastic, you should continue to sing like that. Nothing wrong with that. I praise God for your good singing here. I do. But if that's all that you hope for in the service and that you feel good after you left this church, then I'm not sure whether I should praise God. Because we need the Word of God. Without the Word of God, we are blind. And we love blindly. You know what I mean? We love blindly if we don't have the Word of God to direct us, to teach us, to show us how we ought to love one another. 
We need both. We need to grow in the knowledge of God. We need to grow in the Christian graces. And we need to grow to have more love for God. How? To know God's word and to obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Some people are offended by that. Seriously, some people are offended by that. All they, all they feel is they need is that I have love and you don't tell me about the love of God. But I show them. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you keep my commandments in John's Gospel 14. Another aspect we should ask ourselves, am I growing? Is that, am I loving God's people more and more? Am I loving God's people more and more and serving them with love? Paul reminds us not to take our liberty for granted and for loose living, but to serve one another with love. Are we growing? Are we bearing fruits in our Christian life? So these are the words that I want to share with you about believers, professing believers. Let's just now look at sinners in this world. There's a message. Sinners must not presume that God's patience will endure forever. You know, God is slow to anger and God has delayed His judgment. And the reason is this, that sinners may have time to repent. But that does not mean God will delay His judgment forever. Isaiah talk about seeking God while He is still there. Isaiah is not talking about God one day will just disappear. <laughs> He's saying God is not waiting there for sinners forever. And you seek Him now while the door of grace is open because the day will come when it is closed. The door of grace will be closed one day. And therefore seek God while He is there. While He is still near. And the problem with men in this world is this. They misinterpret God's patience. They misinterpret God's patience. Because God is patient, delay His judgment, and men begin to think that, well, God is not real because I don't see God's judgment. You know, I don't see God's judgment immediately fall, fall upon that, that guy, you know, or, or me even perhaps. I'm still okay. I, I don't love God as you say. I don't even believe in Him, but I'm still okay. So where is God, they say? Where is God's judgment? Ah, you preachers, you Christian alarmists. Just because God has not meted out His judgment immediately, these people conclude or the world conclude that God doesn't exist and they mock at the promised judgment of God. You can go back and read up to Peter. He says this, Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, follow, following after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For forever since the fathers fell asleep, all continued just as it was from the beginning of creation. And by, the, by His word, the present heavens and earth will be, are being preserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destructions of ungodly men. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some call slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You see the argument of the unbelievers? You have been talking about the judgment of God since our father's days. It has been like that. Until now, it still has been like that. You have been preaching this. But look at us. We are still all right. Where is the judgment of God? They ask. They challenge and they mock Christians. They mock at God. They misinterpreted God's patience. The present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, 
kept for the day of judgment and destructions of godly men, Peter says. The, slow, the Lord is slow about his is not slow about his promise as some counted slowness, but is patient towards you. That is the reason why God has not meted out his judgment there and here now. There is a reason behind it. God is being gracious. God is being patient with this world, with sinners. But man has forgotten this. Man has forgotten that God actually destroyed this world once. In the time of Noah. You know, Noah preached for how many years? At least 100 years. Maybe the first day he preached, people pay attention. Oh, what is Noah saying? It is something new, you know. And then at the same time, you look at his house there, beside the house, he's building an ark. What is he doing? People are curious, perhaps, the first day. But after one month, Noah is still preaching the same thing. After one year, he's still preaching the same thing. After 10 years, he's still preaching the same thing. My grandson is now 10 years old, you know, <laughs> Noah. <laughs> and you're still preaching the same thing? <laughs> 50 years later, he's still preaching the same thing? <laughs> Men are still saying the same to, the, to us. For the two, last 2,000 years, you people have been preaching about God's judgment. Where is God? Where is the judgment of God? Well, God is being patient towards sinners that we may have time to repent. God is being patient for a purpose, for the salvation of sinners. Man has forgotten the real reason for the delay of God's judgment. God does not wish everyone to perish, but that they may come to the Lord for mercy and salvation. And we should be thankful. We should be thankful that God is slow to execute His judgment. Otherwise, all of us will perish and without hope. So let me ask you this. If you are not in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not saved. Are you saved in the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you are not saved, you have a belief in Jesus Christ, but perhaps you have been listening to preach, preachings in this church, or maybe your Christian friends also have been sharing with you, and you're still not a believer. Why not? Why not? Are you mocking at God's patience, misinterpreting His delay of the judgment, as if, you know, God is just threatening us but nothing will happen. You know, be very careful. Don't take God's patience for granted. God is not to be mocked, but God is being gracious. God is being kind and offer the gospel of Jesus Christ to all sinners and that we may believe in Him and be saved. That is the only reason why God is still not executing His judgment today. He could have done it right here today. He could have, but he's not. Obviously, he's not yet. That's why we are still here. <laughs> yeah. If he execute it now, some of us will, will not be here. But God is being patient, gracious to us. And seek him while he's still near. Seek Christ while the door of grace is still open. Don't wait until it is closed. Now we must conclude. Suffering in this world is generally caused by the fall of man, by the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden. It was indeed the sin of man. The sin of Adam brought chaos and disorder and suffering into this world. But that does not mean that we should assume that every tragedy in life is the result of some personal sin in that person. And therefore, strategy is struck in this particular manner. That would be presumptuous. That would be playing God. You know, sometimes I come across certain Christians, they are like Job's friend. You know, you know, 
Brother, why you are suffering like that? Because you know there are certain sin in your life that you have you have not repented. And sometimes, oh, let me just give an example. You know, you instead of serving in the church here in GRC, you went to 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 UK or somewhere, and life there has been difficult for you. Do you know why? You should have gone there. You should have remained in GRC and served God here. God is punishing you. You know, you heard of things like that. <laughs> And sometimes I come across comments like that. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Though I do believe in the sovereignty of God, and if God put, put us here in this country, then I believe we should serve God in this country. But if you choose to migrate, that is between you and God. That's all I would say. <laughs> Let's just not be presumptuous. Let's just not play God. But in every tragedy that we come across, either in people's life of our own, it is time to reflect upon our relationship with God and make sure that we are walking right with God. Secondly, God is very patient with mankind, both believers and unbelievers. To the believers, God expects us to bear fruits. God expects us to bear fruits. God has not immediately cut off those branches that are not bearing fruit and throw them into the fire of judgment. But that does not mean they will not be cut off. A day will come, God the Father will do that. We must not, talk, we must not take God's patience for granted. For those who are bearing fruit, God is glorified in our lives. God is glorified. And we prove to, to the world that we are indeed the disciples of Christ, Jesus says. To the unbelievers, God is patient and He has delayed His judgment for your good. For your good. And you can't see the immediate judgment of God yet, but that does not mean that God is blind to all your sin. God is indifferent to all that you have committed and all the sins you have. God is giving you time to repent. And unless you repent, you shall perish at the judgment. Let us close in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we do want to thank you indeed once again for your inspired words that you have given to us. Father, we are mindful that as believers, we need your word. We need your word to bear fruits because we need guidance. We need to know what is right, what is wrong, what is what are the things that are honourable in your sight. And Father, therefore, may you help us uh, create in us this greater hunger for your words. At the same time, Father, we pray too for grace, that we will receive your words with meekness, and that we may have grace in our hearts to obey. For you have said that if we love God, we will obey his commandments. Therefore, do help us. We are mind mindful indeed that we are very weak people. We need your happy state. We pray for those who are still outside your kingdom. Oh Lord, that you will speak to them about their needs, about their sins, about the reality of your judgment, and that they may come before you in repentance. For all this we ask and pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.